Welcome to the first meeting of the Denver Astrology Group in two years. This is our first meeting since the pandemic. Um, yeah, it feels really good to be back here at the Mercury Cafe. Um, for those that aren't aware, we start, I started this group back in May of 2008, and we had a really nice 12-year run there where we didn't miss almost a single meeting for 12 years until the pandemic hit and the lockdowns happened starting in March of 2020. So um, since that time, you know, it was a lot of things have happened, and we've been wanting to bring the group back, but wasn't sure when it was time. But it feels like uh, with Jupiter and Pisces this spring, um, that we're finally getting back to normal and it was time to bring the group back. So um, let's see, a few things to get out of the way first. So thanks everybody. We weren't sure since this is our first time doing a group meeting, like um, what to do in terms of masks and other things like that. So we ended up asking for a mask policy very late in the process just to help feel make some people feel more comfortable coming back. Uh, we'll continue to talk about that over the course of the next few months. But since there was first meeting, we just felt like playing it safe. Um, I am going to not wear a mask just so you can hear me, but I did take a COVID test this morning and it was negative just for the sake of being safe. Um, so what we're going to do in this meeting is um, I'm going to open up just by talking about some transits starting two years ago at the beginning of the pandemic, some of the major outer, tra outer planet transits that were indicating what was going on and what was happening in the world in general. And we're going to personalize some of that by talking about how some of those transits impacted us in our personal lives over the past two years. So some of those transits, for example, were Saturn going through Aquarius, where in March and April of 2020, Saturn went into Aquarius. Uh, Mars conjoined Saturn in that sign. And that was sort of like the beginning of the lockdowns and everything else and a lot of the things we've been experiencing over the past few years. So I want to talk about some of these transits in the context of our birth charts. And I was hoping that individuals would feel comfortable coming up to the mic and sharing um, one positive transit that they had or one negative transit that they had over the course of the past two years and how that worked out in their personal life. Because sometimes it's really by talking about our personal stories that astrology comes alive in a way that's much different than when you're just reading about it in a book or you're watching it on a YouTube channel or something like that. And having the ability to have those discussions, I thought, would be a good way to bring the group back and uh, start building a sense of community again after that little two-year break. So um, why don't we get started first by... I wanted to pull up some charts to set some of the context for the group. So first, I wanted to pull up the chart of the Mercury Cafe. So this is the actual birth chart for the opening and the first day of business of this building when Marilyn um, opened it on Halloween day, Halloween morning, October 31st, 1990. And this was, uh, Marilyn's in the audience, this was an electional chart, right? Yeah, and you can kind of see that because it's funny when you look at charts done by astrologers, some things are done very deliberately. In this instance, Marilyn put it so that the Sun and Venus were right on the ascendant at five degrees of Scorpio, and Jupiter was placed right on the degree of the Midheaven at 12 degrees of Leo. And then um, the Mercury Cafe opened for business in this location for the first time at this exact moment, and this has forever been the sort of birth chart of the Mercury Cafe and the energy of this place, and as well as some of the events that have happened with it. So one of the things that's been really fascinating that we talked about even a few years ago that was starting to happen as Saturn was transiting through Capricorn in 2017 and through 2020 is that Saturn was going through the third house of the Mercury Cafe's actual birth chart. And the third house is the house uh, that represents your neighbors and your neighborhood. And, this, and the Mercury Cafe was actually going through a Saturn return at that time. And one of the things that was funny is for you know many years, this building was kind of on the outskirts of downtown Denver. But then all of a sudden during that time frame over the past several years, these huge high rises and like skyscrapers started going up. And now we can all see as we look out the window that there's just buildings and sort of a flourishing neighborhood of large buildings that's almost dwarfing the Mercury Cafe in some reasons, in some respects. So um, this is a good example of how sometimes 
even the birth charts of businesses or entities or other things that are not necessarily humans, not birth charts, can still be reflected in the transits of what's going on in the world at the time. Um, and then, of course, in 2020, Saturn ingressed into Aquarius and went into the fourth house of the Mercury Cafe chart. And the Mercury Cafe was able to weather the pandemic. Um, and then eventually Marilyn uh, made the choice to sell the Mercury Cafe to new owners, which I thought was kind of interesting symbolically, since the fourth house in a birth chart represents what? Your, your parents. So who are the parents of a business? It's the owner. It's the person who started it and who sort of birthed it and, and nursed it and brought it up into the world. And then at some point when there's a transition or there was a transition here, um, Saturn was transiting through the fourth house. Um, yeah, so that's been a major change, but it's also been nice to see some continuity in the Mercury Cafe and that we're still able to do things like have these meetings here and have it be a thriving place for community, not just for our group, for, but for other, other groups as well. All right. Um, here is the chart for the sale of the Mercury Cafe. This was the one you ended up using, right, Marilyn? Yeah. Okay, so it's June 22nd, 2021. And you can see that Saturn was right at 12 degrees of Aquarius, um, which in the previous chart was the exact degree of the IC in the birth chart of the Mercury Cafe. So it wasn't just that it was going through the fourth whole sign house, but it actually hit the degree of the IC at the time of the sale. And some of that was like electional because you were searching for a good chart, but some of that was sort of accidental of just the timing, right? Actually, do you want to come up to the mic and talk about the chart? Mm -hmm. I didn't know that we were going to talk about these charts, Sorry. but it's fine. Um, I really liked, I wanted the Sun Jupiter trine, and I think there was another trine in there that I was looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted the power of the solstice. The transit that to me, really depicts this sale is the Uranus opposition from the seventh house to the first house in the original chart. And that also I'm 71 years old and I knew <laughs> when I was 68 that I needed to figure out the future because I really can't work that hard anymore. <laughs> Do you mind if we take a look at your chart? Uh, we don't have to. It's up to you. Well, do you want to look at this chart anymore? Yeah, I mean, there's is a there lot. A, so this is an electional chart that you and I talked about yeah. and went over it, ended up kind of picking together because you were like, find a chart that's really close to the summer solstice. And one of the things we got was Mercury stationing direct in Gemini in the first whole sign house. Oh, yeah. Okay, all those stations. There's really three stations. Jupiter stations retrograde and I think... Uh, Neptune, although it doesn't show it on the chart, is really stationary too. That if we could see these planets in the sky, they'd be standing still. And I don't remember the, it was like within a day, all these stationary things. Yeah, in the bottom right corner, there's a little table that shows the last station of each planet and the next station. So it shows that Mercury was about to station 10 hours later. So it was basically stationary direct that day. Um, elsewhere, Jupiter had just stationed retrograde 1.2 days before. So Jupiter was stationary retrograde, basically. And then, yeah, there's Neptune. Neptune was about to station three days later. Yeah, and because they move slow, it's like by then Neptune's pretty much standing still. I wanted the power of the stations and I wanted the power of the solstice. And when I started talking to Chris about it, we were looking at different charts, and I said, well, hey, wait, what if we put Jupiter on the mid of And he goes, yeah, but that's about the middle of the night. <laughs> it's like, it's okay. Right. Well, it was early in the morning, so yeah. you have to like sign the paperwork basically we did. We before were here. sunrise. And you got the other owners to go along with yeah. that? Yeah. Nice. And so in this chart, where is the Uranus? Um, Uranus is at 13 degrees of Taurus. Right. Okay. And in the original chart of the Mercury, Mercury is at 13 degrees Scorpio mm. and the midheaven and nadir are at 12 degrees. So to me, that Uranus transit is really a kickoff on something must change. Right. So it was part of that um, tension that we're experiencing over the past year between the Saturn and Uranus square in the sky, where they're really yeah. close to each other and that tension between 
keeping the status quo and wanting to maintain old things versus um, needing to make major radical changes for the future. Yeah. Yeah. So for and you, demanding change, you know, right. Like change being a necessity at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, partially because it was hard running a business like during the pandemic, I'm sure, especially one that was more community oriented. It was hilarious and hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, it's really, yeah, fitting then that in the Mercury Cafe chart, Mercury itself is at 13. So it really was getting hit by both that Uranus opposition as well as the the Saturn square from Aquarius. Yeah. So really, those are two of the main energies hitting Mercury itself for the Mercury Cafe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Do you have like a transit or anything in your chart that was? Okay. My chart and one of the new owners charts, the Neptune hits hard. Um, transiting Neptune opposes my seventh house planets and is the ruler of the ascendant. And. One of the new owners has a 21 degrees Sagittarius Neptune. And so things were cloudy. <laughs> sure. And still yet to be revealed. Okay. So there's some like uncertainty. That's always really tricky with Neptune transits is when you're in the middle of them, it's hard to see outside of that. Yeah. Things are, there's that. And there's also illusion and delusion and deception. <laughs> mm. Sure. Yeah. But um, here we are. Here we are today. The astrologers meeting the Mercury Cafe. It's great. Yeah. Well, and it was largely thanks to you because you kept encouraging me saying it's time to come back. It's time to get the astrology meetings going again. And you've always helped us to start this group and have it for, you know, so long now for 14 years. So thanks a lot for allowing this to happen. I'm addicted to community and the astrology language. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. So here's the electional chart for the very first meeting of the Denver Astrology Group, which was an election that I picked on May 4th, 2008, starting at exactly one o'clock p.m. Um, in Denver, Colorado. And one of the things that was really striking when the pandemic happened is that Uranus was transiting through the middle of Taurus and just started really nailing a lot of the Taurus planets that I had set up in the electional chart for this group. So this is um, on the inside wheel, it shows the chart for the Denver Astrology Group. And on the outside wheel, it shows the transits for our last meeting that we had on March 14th of 2020. And that was right when the lockdowns started ha were about to start happening, and so we had to we had a, a speaker coming in from out of town, but we had to switch it to an online meeting at the last minute because the lockdowns had started and and everything was just going crazy. So one of the things you notice is that transiting Uranus was at four degrees of Taurus at that point, which was exactly conjoining the natal Moon and the natal Venus. Uh, that were up in the 10th house of the Denver Astrology Group's chart. So there was just this unexpected or sudden disruption in something that had been relatively stable for you know 12 years up to that point, not missing a single meeting. And then suddenly Uranus comes in and like it does sometimes in transits to your birth chart, it can kind of like bulldoze things or really shake things up unexpectedly. So that's one of the transits I want people to sort of pay attention to is the Uranus transits that were happening over the past few year, years because those slow moving Uranus transits can be very important, especially when they make a hard aspect like a conjunction or square or opposition to one of your natal planets. It can uh, shake things up or disrupt things, sometimes in positive, unexpected ways, other times in negative ways. The core theme is always just an unexpected surprise or disruption of some sort. And here is the chart for that last meeting of the Denver Astrology Group on March 14th, 2020. And the big thing that you can see that all the astrologers commented on in the, at the time was that there was just this huge pileup of planets in the sign of Capricorn. And that Capricorn stellium was one of the characteristic things that um, started building up in early 2020. Uh, especially starting with the Saturn-Pluto conjunction that happened in January. And I think it was the very day of the Saturn-Pluto conjunction around January 
12th or 13th or something like that, that the New York Times ran one of its first stories about COVID and this mysterious uh, virus that had broken out in China. So that Saturn-Pluto conjunction is one of the major signatures that astrologers ended up associating the pandemic with in the same way that other Saturn-Pluto conjunctions going back for example, the previous one being in 1980, 1981 in Libra was really the start of the AIDS pandemic. Uh, so if you take those Saturn-Pluto conjunctions back, you tend to see major turning points and pandemics and things like that at that time. Um, all of that got accelerated because Jupiter also was there conjoining Saturn and Pluto. And then Mars moved into Capricorn right when all of the lockdowns started happening pretty much across the U.S. and across most of the world at that point, And it became a worldwide thing. So what happened after that point, though, is Saturn in late March made its first initial ingress into the sign of Aquarius. So all of a sudden, Saturn has moved into a new sign of the Zodiac, and it's activating, for many people, a brand new part of their chart all of a sudden. And this is right when we're in the thick of the early phases of the lockdowns. And not long after that, transiting Mars came up, and also moved into Aquarius. And we had this major Mars-Saturn conjunction in the sign of Aquarius, which occurs about every two or two and a half years. But sometimes, at least traditionally or in ancient astrology, Mars-Saturn alignments or conjunctions tended to be associated with pandemics as well, because Mars and Saturn were the two quote-unquote malefic planets. Um, so the last time we had one of those, for example, the Mars-Saturn conjunction in Scorpio back in like 2013, I remember there was uh, some panic about the outbreak of Ebola and the attempts to sort of put a, a stop to that, to stop it from spreading too far, which ended up being successful or at least more successful than what happened later with COVID. So that ingress of Saturn in March of 2020 marked a major shift for a lot of people because as soon as Saturn moved into Aquarius, it moved into a new whole sign house. And so it would have been activating a new sector of your chart or a new area of your life at that time. So one of the things I'd like everybody to think about is what um, whole sign house did Saturn move into in March of 2020 for you? What topics are associated with that house? And in what ways did some of those topics become more prominent in your life over the course of the past two years since that time, roughly starting in about March or April of 2020? So for many people, it was initially because it wasn't just Saturn, but also Mars moving into that sign at the same time. It was often some sort of difficult thing was brought up at that time in that sector of their life or in that area of their life. There was a challenge that arose at that time. So in terms of topics, here's a diagram that lists the different significations of the houses that you should think about or that should come to mind when you're talking about or thinking about the different areas of your life and the different houses of the chart. So the first house pr primarily represents the body and the physical incarnation, but also um, a person's mind and character and spirit. Sometimes first house transits can be reflected in changes in terms of your appearance or how you appear to the world in some way. But it can also reflect, if it's a difficult transit, sometimes a challenging um, health event can come up during that time. The second house is finances and possessions and income. So your, your money, basically, and your possessions. The third house is things like siblings, short distance travel, education, but also communication, like how you talk, how you receive information and learn, but also how you communicate information and what you know to the world. The fourth house is parents, your home and living situation, extended family, and also just your private life in general, since the fourth house is the most hidden part of the chart and is opposite to the 10th house, which is the most public part of the chart and represents your public life. Uh, the fifth house is things like children, creativity, uh, pleasure and how you do relaxation, and also sometimes sex and sexuality and topics surrounding it. The sixth house can be illness, injuries, but also work, 
you, like your job. And sometimes if you're in a managerial position, it can be subordinates or people that work for you. Seventh house is relationships, partnership, marriage, and other people in general in your life. The eighth house can be uh, issues related to mortality or death, but also inheritance and the assets that belong to other people in your life besides you, since the eighth house is the second house relative to the seventh house of other people. Uh, ninth house is travel, things that are foreign from your culture that you grew up in, but also education and religion. The 10th house is career, action, reputation, and your public life. The 11th house is friends, groups, alliances, and hopes for the future or things that you're building on towards the future. And then finally, the 12th is one of the more difficult houses and can sometimes pertain to themes like enemies or people that you just don't get along with or that work at cross purposes to you in your life. Um, also, sometimes illness, loss, or themes having to do with seclusion or isolation. So everybody should think about what their right, what your rising sign is, and then what house Saturn moved into relative to your rising sign, if you just count signs from your rising sign, starting in March of 2020. All right, so to give sort of a demonstration of that, so this is my chart, and I have Aquarius rising, and um, what happened with the last meeting so this is my chart on the inside and this is the transits for the last meeting of the denver astrology group in the middle of march of 2020 and um what happened is that using the timing technique known as perfections that we've talked about in a previous meeting a few years ago, where you just count one sign per year from the rising sign, and then whatever sign you land on um, is activated for that year of your life. So you start at your rising sign for the first year of your birth, then at your first birthday, it moves to the second sign, then at the next birthday, it moves to the third sign, and so on and so forth. So I was in a 12th house perfection year, um, when the pandemic hit in March of 2020, and it was activating my natal Mars placement at 19 degrees of Capricorn in the 12th house. And the 12th is one of the more difficult houses. And what happened is that transiting Mars came up and conjoined my natal Mars. And then about a week or two after that, both Mars and Saturn moved into Aquarius in my first house and formed that conjunction in my first house of body and health and physical vitality. And what happened is that I got sick basically that weekend of the last meeting of the Denver Astrology Group and I got COVID. Um, but what happened is I thought it was going to be a light thing and it was going to wear off af after like a week or something like that. I just hang out like everyone was doing and then bounce back to normal. But then the cough lasted and the fatigue lasted for over a month. And I was kind of bedridden for a month as Saturn moved into my first house and into Aqu Aquarius. And I knew sort of intellectually at the time that that could mean that I was in for some sort of longer term um, health issue. But at the time, it just seemed like something that would pass and I would get over after a few weeks. But because Saturn had just ingressed into Aquarius, it was indicating the beginning of a two or three year transit of Saturn through my first house of body and physical vitality. And in working with clients in the past, I knew for 10 years that Saturn transits through the first house. Saturn can slow things down. It can indicate um, advancements in age, like feeling older, uh, feeling slower. It can indicate major health crises and dealing with health issues that are hard or take a lot of work to out overcome or to push through. And after basically like a, I ended up being sick for about two months before I started fully recovering. And then after that point, I was still dealing with this weird fatigue that never went away, that I was always tired. And I had this uh, fogginess in my head and my memory didn't work as well, even though that always used to be one of my strongest sort of gifts was having a good memory. 
and for the next several months, um, I realized and it started to emerge that some people, for some reason, COVID hit them differently and led to longer term symptoms that they call long COVID and that doctors don't really know how to treat. They're trying to figure out how to treat it, but it turns into like a longer term health issue for some percentage of people. And unfortunately, I was one of them. So that was my Saturn transit, or that's been my Saturn transit through the first house was the first year of that was learning how to deal with a long-term sort of illness that was slowing me down or that was impairing me um, and made me feel like I had aged 10 years basically over the course of a few months, which is very fitting for a Saturn transit for, for anybody that knows what Saturn transits are like. Um, the ideas of like age and time and things like that are, are usually very prominent. So in this instance, because it was my first house, it was relating to the body. So the good news is that by the end of 2020, Jupiter also moved into Aquarius and it caught up with Saturn and started moving through my first house. And at that Saturn-Jupiter conjunction was actually when the um, vaccines were first rolled out. Um, and I ended up getting the vaccine not long after that. And it actually did help with some of the symptoms that I was dealing with of long COVID for almost a year at that point. So there was starting to be an improvement during the course of 2021 as I learned sort of how to deal with it. And it had some additional tools for addressing this like long-term illness that it developed with Saturn in the first house. So that was the both the negative transit, but also the positive transit of Jupiter kind of swooping in and cleaning things up a little bit. Um, so now I'm just getting through the rest of that Saturn transit through the first house over the course of this year. And then early next year, Saturn will depart from Aquarius and move into Pisces and go into my second house. And I sort of expect at that point that I'll be in much better shape than I have been over the past like year or two. Not yeah, not, not financially, but that's I'll, I'll take that um, at this point and get as long as Saturn departs from the first. So anyways, I wanted to explain that story partially as an example to set up what I had in mind when I was going to ask people to share stories of Saturn transits through whatever house it went through or Jupiter transits or whatever other long-term transits you've all been experiencing in order to personalize some of what the past two years have been like, um, but also in order to explain why we're just now finally like having the first meeting of the Denver Astrology Group in two years. It was because I didn't have the energy to do it until now. But that's one of the reasons I'm so excited to be back here today and to be starting this group again and, and getting back to normal finally, um, not just for the community, but also for myself personally. All right. So um, with that set up, I think out of the way, um, is there anybody that has a good transit that's had a good outer planet transit that's a really good example that you would be willing to share with us, either a positive one or a negative one? and that you'd be willing to share your birth chart and just talk about it for, let's say, like three to five minutes each. Yeah, you got one? Okay, come up to the mic. All right, what's your name? Mark Anthony Montoya. Mark, what's your birth date? 22886. What's your birth time? 225 p.m. In what place? Colorado Springs, Colorado. All right. Is your ascendant at 29 Cancer? Yep, that's me. Okay, cool. Um, so let's see. I'm not sure if I should state placements. Maybe not. Maybe we'll wait. Why don't you tell me what your transit was? Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, I was um, around that time. Saturn. Uh, was in Capricorn, so certainly my seventh house was being affected. Uh, so going back to March 2020, things are going well. I recently moved to Las Vegas in 2019 through 2020. I went there, lived in Denver for about 10 years, um, decided to move to Las Vegas to pursue DJing and for my career. Uh, made some good inroads, and then COVID hit, uh, shut everything down, and so uh, made a very quick decision to end my lease, move back to uh, Pueblo, Colorado, and um, you know, I'm still kind of in the midst of rebuilding my life. I like to call it a personal renaissance, essentially. Mm. Um, so certainly my seventh house is really affected as well as my career and even um, kind of my, my philosophies in terms of what I now value in life in terms of uh, I'm really into farming now, like backyard gardening. 
I'm part of the Pueblo Food Project. We're all about uh, food, agriculture, sustainability. Uh, North Node is in, uh, my North Node is in Taurus. So Uranus and Taurus, I feel like is really affecting that in terms of, you know, at one moment I'm pursuing music for, for a passion and now all of a sudden I'm a gardener. Right. Never would have uh, thought that, never would have put uh, those two together. Yeah, and, that would you have know, been some of that Uranus transit through your 11th house as well, of Uranus going through Taurus and the community, but also that being sort of a sudden or unexpected thing. Exactly, yep. What were you saying after right about that? Uh, so, so, yeah, you know, um, really with uh, even the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction, I uh, had some interesting experiences. My uh, lo- you know, kind of relationship had ended at that point mm-hmm. uh, somewhat abruptly. And prompted me to move, you know, I, I've essentially, you know, went to Las Vegas in 2019, pandemic hit, moved back to Colorado in 2020, moved to Boulder, came back to Pueblo, moved to Reno, came back to Pueblo. So, you know, throughout the whole process, I'm, you know, just searching to find home in the midst of a lot of external turmoil with the world. You know, I wasn't able to work, kind of uh, wrote out unemployment as long as I could, you know, so fortunately for the, the stimulus money. Um, Currently, you know, I'm, I'm working, you know, I have a job as a, at a marketing agency and I'm rebuilding my career on that point. At this moment, uh, I'm actually at a high point in my career when it comes to my finances. Um, but certainly uh, 2020, 2021 were really low points in terms of my money game, uh, my relationships, and really just uh, learning how to accept life in general. Really inspired by the book, uh, A Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, where he's talk, talking about uh, whatever external circumstances may exist, um, nothing can take away my personal will to live life robustly. So really easier said than done, s- sincerely. Um, and, you know, fortunately, uh, recently I had a Jupiter return within the last few months. Yeah, so your Jupiter is located at one degree of Pisces with your Pisces stellium. Right. Nice. Um, yeah, so that makes a lot of sense. And, and during the entire second half, talking about the career things and some of the challenges there, that was one of the other standout transits in the entire second half of 2020 was the Mars retrograde and the sign of Aries, because it moved into Aries over the summer um, earlier in 2020, right here, like June, July of 2020, it already moved into Aries and into your 10th whole sign house. Um but then it slowed down in September and it's stationed retrograde. And then it just like grinded across those degrees for a few months right. before it eventually stopped and left that sign in like early 2021. Exactly. So that Mars retrograde would have coincided with some of the challenges uh, in terms of your career, especially in the second half of 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you said the relationship stuff and a lot of that was Saturn going through um, you know, it's tricky it's because your ascendant is so late at 29 degrees of Cancer. Uh, that entire Capricorn transit is like Saturn through your seventh whole sign house. But even once Saturn got into early Aquarius, I think it's stationed at what two degrees of Aquarius and then it retrograded back into Capricorn. So right. it was just like straddling your descendant for the better part of, of a year or two. So some of the, the relationship stuff, you said that a major relationship ended. Uh, yeah, you know, she, she was really cool. It, uh, kind of dissolved abruptly. Um, but you know, once again, instead of, uh, trying to, to fight for something, uh, something internally just made me learn the practice of accepting. So like really, as we speak right now, um, in 2022, I'm still working on that new perspective and mindset in terms of, um, accepting things that I really don't have any control of. And, uh, and with that, you know, it just brings, deeper sense of, of happiness and, and joy. But yeah, it's like a, a whole uh, personal philosophy has really in the last year and a half because of that, I think um, really been a, a focus and practice for me. Uh, we have a, a Instagram mutual friend, uh, Riss, you know, she's my shadow work coach. I've been working with her like really throughout this process as well. So that would make sense as to why um, my person, my personal viewpoints on myself as an individual have shifted, as well as uh, how I foresee an ideal, healthier relationship looking in the future. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, mm-hmm. and that's really big Saturn themes. I think is like sometimes learning to um, identify and let go of the things that you can't change, and being okay with that, which is kind of like a Stoic sort of 
mindset, but it can be a very important one sometimes during heavy Saturn transits is trying to identify those things that you can change in your life and, and like fighting to change those things that you actually can control versus sometimes the things that are outside of your control, learning to, to be okay with them and to let them go. Totally. Yeah. So, all right. So that was Saturn, the seventh house transit. And then you're about two thirds of the way through the Saturn transit through your eighth house, which represents is one of the financial sectors and just um, some of the things that go along with that. Right. So, so, you know, um, having moved beyond some of the more challenging relationship things, you know, I'm working on getting my credit together, really focused on getting into real estate. Um, I'm into precious metals. So I figured out a strategy to get silver bullion and uh, get a loan in exchange for it to go buy more silver bullion. It's a new strategy, but you know, I'm learning how to leverage money in order to uh, make a little bit more money. So, uh, so yeah, certainly working on uh, those long-term asset pieces in my fin financial, you know, uh, lifestyle. And it's, it's, it's been a challenge, you know, like literally, um, like a lot of people in 2020 through up to this point, uh, just getting, getting by day to day, paycheck to paycheck. And fortunately I'm at a good point now where, um, I, once again, because of the current job I have and really working to get my credit put together in the last two to three years, I'm finally in a position to where maybe I can take out a loan. I was recently pre-approved for a home mortgage for like the first time like ever. So nice. it's not a lot, but it's, it's enough to at least get into the market. So, so yeah, um, I, I appreciate Saturn. Uh, you know, I, I, I like you said, the, the stoic thing, you know, as a moon in Scorpio, I take that as a compliment to some degree. Um, and so with Saturn, I appreciate like the long-term, uh, dedication to something in order to build it for sustainability. So, um, yeah, ideally, you know, in the next few, few weeks and months, I'll be able to get some loan and, um, get into, into that. So fortunately, I think really I'm feeling pretty good right now because of all the Pisces stellium at the mm -hmm. present moment. Uh, Neptune has been stationed on my natal Venus for the past, uh, almost half a year or so. So, you know, really helping me focus on, um, just finding pleasure in the moment and also rede redefining what's valuable in life. So like really appreciating time, you know, versus money. And, uh, with eighth house just really looking to figure out how to get passive income flowing so I can have more time and money flowing in, you know, it's easier said than done, but I'm, you know, inspired by Robert Kiyosaki. Uh, I guess one, one last thing I'll mention is I recently went to Miami about a month ago for work. Um, got to see growth conference from Grant Cardone. He's like a YouTube influencer. Uh, he, d he was in Pueblo uh, for undercover billionaire, which was like a TV show where he had to create a business in 90 days and uh, make it worth a million dollars or more. So that's where I actually work right now is a, a place called wake up Pueblo or a marketing agency um, that this guy created on a TV show during the time where like I randomly moved home because of COVID and they're taping a TV show in my hometown because it's like uh, a beat up economic spot. And they're like, if you can make it here, you can literally make it anywhere in America. So the fact that I got to go to his uh, conference in Miami a, a few weeks ago, uh, is just very surreal. Like that's just, you know, kind of my feelings in the last couple of years is very surreal. Yeah. That's awesome. And those are really concrete things. Some of the things you're mentioning of things like debt and loans are really concrete eighth house uh, significations. And that's when I use the keyword at the beginning of, you know, other people's money or other people's assets, the assets of others for the eighth house, that's one of the ways that that comes into play in really concrete ways. So that's really cool that you've had, you know, sometimes a Saturn transit when Saturn will like close one door, it opens another. Um, so it sounds like that's a little bit of your experience of Saturn going through your eighth house and sometimes an initial difficulty or surmountable difficulty ends up opening up other opportunities in that area of your life. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Did you have one? All right. What's your name? Ashley. What's your birth date? October 21st, 1982. What time? 3.15 PM. What city? Miami Beach. Florida. All right. 
is your ascendant to 18 Aquarius? Yes. Cool. All right. Um, what, so you, what have your transits been like? Well, I've had two major lifetime transits in two years. Mm -hmm. In 2020, I had a baby. Wow. So first house Aquarius. And then this year, last year and this year going through a divorce. Okay. Last year and this year. Um, so Saturn's been transiting over your ascendant and then it, that means it's been opposing your descendant yeah. degree, which can sometimes create, um, attention and whatever the opposite house is that Saturn's transiting through. Yeah. And then I've had Neptune and Pluto transits back to back. Um, what were your Neptune and Pluto transits? Mars, moon, Neptune square. Okay. And Pluto, Venus, Saturn, Pluto. So Pluto's in late Capricorn, so it's squaring your... Okay, yeah. So you have two two stelliums, but the clustering is yeah. a bunch of planets in late Libra. So yeah. Pluto's been squaring all of that, including the ruler of your ascendant and your natal Venus at 24 and 25 Libra. Um, and then Neptune at in late Pisces at this point is squaring Mars, uh, the moon, and Neptune in late Sagittarius. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a lot of, that's a lot of outer planet transits. I'm ready for a gift or something different. Sure. <laughs> uh, I had someone tell me, after you go through crazy Pluto transits, like you get a gift. I'm like, I'm ready. Yeah, right? I, I mean, I'm holding on hope. Yeah. Sometimes it, Pluto can take us to the depths yeah. of, uh, <clears throat> you know, the human psyche and of human experience. But then sometimes we do find things there that are very valuable and then the challenge is then to bring that back up from the underworld and to emerge from that at the end of the transit yeah and i'd also say that i have a full-time job but i'm also an astrologer and a past life regression practitioner so i've been doing a lot more deeper soulful integration into the work that i do okay. so that makes a lot of sense yeah, the mm -hmm. Neptune stuff would be very helpful for that, I would think. Mm -hmm. um, squaring your natal Neptune, um, as well as your moon and your Mars up there in Sagittarius. Um, what else is going on? And then the Pluto transit, and then, yeah, the Saturn transit, and you had your first child. Was it your first child? Yeah, my first child in August of 2020. Okay, August. So when in March, you know, I, you know, started to really show, but then mm. I was like locked in and like, that's like, you really look like you're pregnant. Okay. Um, and that started like the end of my, you know, pregnancy during that major lockdown. That's pretty wild. So that was right when, if that was yeah. like, especially in the second half of March, that's when Saturn went into Aquarius for the first I time. I mean, there's people that I work with that didn't even know I had a kid because like I wasn't showing until, you know, you're locked down and then you're just working remotely most of the time. Got you. Okay. So that was your like first house body changes, yeah. like physical body changes transit is that you became pregnant basically and or started noticing in March of 2020. And similar to your story in the sense of it wasn't COVID, but postpartum is you <laughs> have zero energy mm -hmm. and you're so tired and it's taken my body a long time to kind of get back the right. energy. To bounce back. From yeah. It. To bounce back from having a kid. And even though it's wonderful and it's beautiful, you're exhausted mm -hmm. most of the time and so now really just starting to feel like the energy is coming back right so i really resonated with what you said yes it's a different situation but it's ultimately like the same kind of health stuff yeah you're dealing with like the same archetype of yeah. like the, the old slow planet sort of moving through your first house mm -hmm. and, and having some of that archetype of saturn manifesting physically in, in the physical body and to some extent, even just in your mental body at the same time, to yeah. the extent that some of the physical stuff is also affecting your mental, mental. state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then did that become, because by, for example, by December and certainly by most of 2021, um, you know, Jupiter moved into Aquarius. So I would think that that would have helped a little bit. Yeah. Um, with Jupiter sort of balancing Saturn out to some extent? A hundred percent. Yeah, it was definitely, my energy started getting better um, around that time. Mm -hmm. And Jupiter kind of, I would say I'd also equate that to like having difficulty though losing the weight. Mm, okay. So I would tie that there too. Yeah. As And then cause like once Jupiter got past that, it, it became a lot easier. Okay. So I did notice that physically. 
Yeah, that's a common thing that astrologers remark on that um, Jupiter transits, sometimes even though they can be positive, um, sometimes you can gain weight during a Jupiter transit through the first house. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's really amazing. So you've had a lot. This is clearly you're having some of the most like important outer planet transits in yeah. your life. And clearly this is like, it's been a huge turning point for you over the past Absolutely. couple yeah. of years. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, so are there any transits like good ones that you're really looking forward to? I guess, um, Jupiter is going through your second house. Now it's about to go into your third house of communication pretty soon. Um, yeah. When it does that, I hope to write a book. Okay. That's the goal. Like you're, that's you're the actually plan. thinking about or anticipating yeah. writing mm -hmm. a book. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, Jupiter's literally, let's, let's look at where it's at now. Jupiter's at 24 Pisces. And um, if we move it forward in May, Jupiter is going to move into Aries on like May 11th mm -hmm. and your third house of communication. So mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be an amazing time to write that, start writing that book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to line it up with the eclipse too. Okay. The, which That's one? On, um, the Scorpio eclipse. Yeah. In the 10th. Perfect. So that's coming up here. That's so soon. We're, we're about to get our first Scorpio eclipse and that's going to fall in your 10th house mm -hmm. of career and public reputation. Mm -hmm. So here is that eclipse. There we go. May 15th ish around 25, 26 Scorpio. Um, yeah. So that's actually, that's great that you mentioned that because that's a major shift that's coming up for everybody and everybody mm -hmm. should be paying attention to where the Taurus and Scorpio eclipses are going to fall in their chart because it's going to activate that axis. Yeah. And selling the house that we own together is happening actually at the end of this month alongside the Taurus eclipse. The one in your fourth house yeah. of home and living situation. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you are an amazing chart example for, <laughs> for transits. Like every one of them is just like nailing it with yeah. really literal. Yeah. Sometimes it's like we have psychological or like internal character experiences of transits and that's valid and important, but can sometimes be harder to articulate. But other times it's like, it can just be very literal. Like mm -hmm. this is the event that coincided with that transit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, so fourth house eclipse coming up, selling your, your home and then 10th house eclipse coming up and you're going to write a book. Yeah. That looks pretty, pretty good. All right. All right. Well, <laughs> thanks for sharing that with us. And you'll have to let us know. I will. Um, yeah. When you write the book and when you publish it and what your transits ended up, end up being for, for that. I will do. Okay. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. All right. Um, is there anybody else that has a transit or anything that's come to mind as you've been hearing some of these stories and you feel like sharing one, even if it's like a little one? Yeah. All right. What's your name? Mani Powers. How do you spell your first name? M-A-N-I. M-A-N-I. Okay. And how, what's your date of birth? October 9th, 1947. What time? 7.30 p.m. And what city? Del Nord. Spell it. D-E-L. D-E-L. Capital N-O-R-T-E. Colorado. Okay. And is your ascendant 27 Taurus? Yeah. Okay. So in March of 2020, March 12th exact, I drank some coffee that had cordyceps in it, which is a mushroom. Okay. And the um, mushrooms were contaminated oh, no. with black mold. Oh. And um, I didn't know that <laughs> until a long time. But um, so that was right when the pandemic was shutting down. Okay or everything was shutting down. So you couldn't, you know, don't go to the emergency room. And anyway, it was terrible. <laughs> I ended up um, getting help from my chiropractor mm. and took um, activated charcoal. Okay. And actually took it for too long because, you know, didn't know what was happening really. Right. And um, then I ended up with severe muscle spasms. And did end up in the emergency room in May of that year. Oh it took a year to get over the 
um, the contamination. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I was looking at the chart and, you know, I don't know what, I'm just learning astrology, so I don't know it too well, but, um, it seems like I would like to understand what happened. Right. Um, so then this past November, hold on, let's, let's focus on that one first and then we'll do the next one. So do you know roughly what part of March it was? Or what day that you took the mushroom? The 12th. It was the 12th. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Yeah, that's that's it right there. Um, so what I was seeing right away was... So I was looking at the, um, the ruler of the ascendant. So the first house, as I talked about earlier, represents the body as well as the mind. Mm -hmm. And your rising sign and your ascendant are in Taurus. And so... One of the things we look at is where is the ruler of the send ascendant, which is the, the planet that rules the first house, because mm -hmm. that planet will become the primary planet that then carries out some of the duties or represents the duties of the first house in the chart, which are body and physical vitality, as well as um, mind and spirit. So the ruler of your ascendant is Venus, and it's located at 25 degrees of Libra in the sixth house. Um, so it's at 25 Libra. And so all of those Capricorn transits that were happening in the later degrees of Capricorn in March of 2020, that stellium of Capricorn planets was all squaring your Venus basically at that time at 25 degrees of Libra. Um, the most important and like slowest moving planet in the entire chart of which is Pluto. And it was squaring your Venus almost exactly at that time. Um, but then what happened is that Mars would have caught up to that over the next few weeks and eventually conjoined Pluto at 24 degrees of Capricorn and 25 degrees of Capricorn squaring your Venus. Um, so you're having basically like transits that could have indicated like a, um, hits to your vitality and health at that time, essentially the most generally speaking. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah. that's one thing I don't, unless does anyone else see anything that I'm missing that I'm overlooking that are like important transits here that could have represented that? Where is that? So transiting Uranus was it? Yeah, that's true. Uranus is going through the first house and it was squaring like Mars down there at five degrees of Leo and as well as the IC. So that can be kind of disruptive. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, well, and I wondered about the Saturn in opposition to my birth Saturn and the moon. <laughs> yeah. So that would have been the start of your whole Saturn opposition transit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, all right. And then what was the more recent event you were, you started well, talking about? To, just to say a little more about this. So I feel like I actually went through a rebirth. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm a different person. So I had had chronic fatigue, cough, coffee with cordyceps. Mm -hmm. um, and after I came through it, I don't have chronic fatigue anymore. So, oh, wow. you know, just a positive thing about a very terrible event. But Okay. So it, yeah. really, it was like a really like difficult thing at the time, but then... And you sort of went into the underworld, like again, like right. a Pluto transit, but then you emerged sort of better or in better shape afterwards. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And was yeah, that and the reason? Different. Was that the reason why you took the cordyceps? Was that you were trying to address the chronic fatigue? Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting, mm -hmm. also, just because natally um, Venus is in the sixth house, as the ruler of the ascendant is natally in the sixth house of illness. And sometimes when people have sixth house placements, it can indicate. Um, physical ailments that come up at some point in the life that the person has to address. Um, so maybe that was what that was activating through that Pluto transit at that time was just the the addressing and attempt to fix that longstanding issue. Right. Well, I've had various things in my life that have been challenging, but not killed me. Mm. Okay. And, yeah. So I think that's that, you know, yeah. all that six out. How long had you struggled with chronic fatigue prior to taking that treatment? Uh, 30 years. 30 years. Okay. Yeah. That's like a full Saturn cycle in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. 
that would have, I mean, if it was 30 years, then that might have started the last time that Saturn went through Capricorn and squared your Venus, the ruler of the Ascendant. So then the next mm, time, 30 years later, mm-hmm. that that came back, it squared it again. You had a health crisis, but you were able to fix it finally. Yeah. Yeah. yeah good. So uh, the eclipse in November, the 18th. The Taurus eclipse? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was very close to your Ascendant, wouldn't, wouldn't yes. it have been? Okay. Yes. And I had a very weird thing happen. I don't even know what happened. Um, I have some close friends that say I was downloaded with uh, light, but I thought I was having a heart attack or a stroke or something. I went to the hospital emergency room that day. It was like 12 hours exactly from when it had been the eclipse and, you know, came out. Knowing that I'm in perfect health, they said I had a blood pressure spike. So, so that made me afraid of the eclipses and the moon. And then Chelsea helped me understand that I'm in my uh, third house um, perfection. Okay. And so the moon. So the moon's activated as right. the time lord of the yeah. planet for the year. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, and that started in October like right. on your birthday. And it was like three days afterwards, after my birthday, I had a car accident and then it just sort of went on and on. Well, and that's not funny is not the right word. I often misuse that word when it's, there's like a good astrology example, but the cancer perfection here is the third house is also the house of like short distance travel, which is like cars and getting around your city. Yeah. So you got in a car accident three days after you moved into that third house perfection year. Yeah. Okay. Was that bad or just a minor thing? Uh, no, it was, um, you know, I felt like, you know, the universe said stop. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I was stopped for six weeks cause I didn't have a car for okay. six weeks, but nobody was hurt. Nothing, you know, insurance paid for everything. It was all fine. You know, it was just, I was supposed to stop. And then, you know, then, then in November, the other thing happened. And, so, um, and it was a blood pressure spike that happened. You said the the day or within hours of the eclipse happening on the degree of your ascendant. Mm-hmm. Okay. And everybody can see this. The, here's November 19th, 2021. And the, we see the moon going exactly in opposition to the sun from 27 Taurus to 27 Scorpio. And the transiting nodes were at one degree of Gemini and one degree of Sagittarius. And anytime a new moon or a full moon takes place within about, let's say, 15 degrees of the nodes, that's when an eclipse takes place. So this was the first in a series of lunar eclipses in Taurus, but this one just happened to fall exactly on the degree of your ascendant. Yeah. And, and it was a blood pressure spike. But what did they say about it or what was the result? Um, <laughs> the result was I had anxiety after that okay. and I've had to deal with that because it, it scared me. I mean, I didn't know what was happening. I still really don't, I mean, understand. Mm. Um, but they couldn't figure out anything that was wrong. I had lots and lots of tests and there's nothing wrong. So. Okay. But it's still something that you're actively like looking into. Right. Well, I want to, you know, we're having more eclipses coming and sure. in Scorpio, I've got all that stuff over there. <laughs> So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So when the eclipses move into the first house, seventh house axis, usually it can be um, bouncing back and forth between themes of yourself and then other people or relationships in the person's life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there is a lot of change going on that way. So, yeah. Okay. So you already sort of anticipate a little bit some of the seventh house changes that are coming up? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I okay. mean, I don't know how it's going to, I don't know what's going to happen with it all, but there's big stuff happening mm-hmm. with my daughter, not with me exactly, but with my daughter. Okay. Yeah. So, um, all right. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah. Did you have a... I would, when I think of like the, that incident that happened with the eclipse, I feel like your Neptune is actually going to be like You're talking about transiting Neptune at 20 Pisces being in a in conjunct or quincunx mm-hmm. with the natal moon at 21 Leo. And usually, like, that's where maybe you're not really 
true what it was, but people told you that's your journey. Right. Well, I'm definitely different. Sure. Yeah, well, I would just, you know, um, sometimes when we see themes like that come up during the first eclipse, it can open up a sort of sequence of events in these six month chapters. Um, and it can be good to just continue to explore and see what you can find. Um, yeah, as those eclipses happening, it, it doesn't always necessarily have to be as dramatic as that first one was. But instead, that may have just like, opened up a series of you looking into things and maybe eventually being able then to catch or find something eventually. Um, you know, before it actually becomes like a major thing. Uh, so I, w I wouldn't mm -hmm. necessarily worry about it too much because while that first one may have been like a physical event, sometimes subsequent ones can be more like a mental um, event or a mental change in yourself and how you relate to other people in your life because it's tying in the seventh house at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I definitely <clears throat> listen to my intuition. I mean, I always have mm. <clears throat> heard it. <laughs> not always acted correctly so okay. now i do sure yeah so that happened yeah good all um, right yeah that's a really good one thank thank you for sharing it yeah. that's those are both like actually really great examples yeah. thank you yeah all right doug do you got one all right Doug. What's your birthday? Uh, May 13, 1952. What time? 5.21 a.m. Kansas City, Missouri. And is your ascendant 25 Taurus? That's me. All right. So you're, <laughs> you're almost a time twin with our previous chart example, which was 27 Taurus. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just a couple of things occurred to me that that were kind, that are kind of uh, classic astrology stuff just sitting here. And the truth is, over the last couple of years, I haven't really uh, been paying that much to my astrology or any astrology. And so I'm sitting here and I'm feeling really rusty. You know, it's right. like I'm, I'm looking at all this and hearing all this stuff. I'm thinking, man, I'm really getting rusty at this stuff. But um, but, uh, you know, one thing uh, this kind of goes along with um, uh, how our birth charts determine our lives uh, and the transits work with the birth charts. And so for the last couple of years, the um, Saturn has been going through my 10th house, it's been, uh, right? So that's been the last couple of years. And so um, it's hard to tell by the whole sign houses you have here, but, uh, my uh, th the way I read it, my all those planets, Jupiter, Mercury, Venus, and t and Sun are all in the twelfth house. So I consider myself a twelfth house person. I can switch the house system. What house system do you want to use? Classicus. Okay. Yeah, just that's what I learned not many years ago. Um, there we go. There we go. Yeah, and so that shows, you know, I'm very much a 12th house person, which I, I feel. I mean, I do consider myself a 12th house person. And um, and actually, I think, um, you know, looking at, you had the chart up about the, the houses, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, man, us 12th house people need some, need an advocacy group. It's like right. law, sickness, enemies. It's like, geez, man. Right. But um, no, the truth is, uh, and seclusion. So the truth is, um, Gal Galileo wrote his best work, most important works while he was under house arrest and he had a stellium in the 12th house. So yeah. sometimes, it, you know, it's a good, it can be. Well, and you know, the, the truth is I'll, I'll just be a little advocate for 12th house here, but the truth okay. is, um, the people I know that are heavily 12th house people, uh, aren't really unfortunate. What they are is kind of quiet and, uh, and, in, in, you know, in interior and oriented towards like, you know, wisdom and thinking and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so, that's certainly my story. And, and most of the people I know that have a lot of 12th house, um, it doesn't seem to be an unfortunate thing. It seems to be just that interior kind of, uh, you know, self seclusion that you enjoy being alone and stuff yeah. like that. But anyway, what I was going to point out um, is that over the last couple of years, as Saturn has transited in my 10th house, um, you know, if had I been a first house person, for example, you know, maybe I would have had some prominence, right? Maybe I'd be on radio and TV. Mm. 
something like that. Uh, but since I'm a 12th house person, it's manifested different. It's manifest the way it manifests in my chart. And so I found myself, I'm very active in another group um, of, of folks, and I found myself sort of turning into like a wise elder of the group, mm -hmm. you know? And so um, I kind of like that. It feels good. You know, it feels good. People look up to me and, and, and that sort of thing. I have more influence and stuff like that. So, um, so I'm just pointing that out as a way a transit interacts with the chart that I have a interior, you know, uh, introverted kind of chart. And so when, when I have my peak of success in the 10th house, it manifests in a quiet way, you know? So, uh, so that's one transit. And the other one I was going to mention is, and I've had a lot of transits over the last couple of years, but I haven't really noticed a whole lot of effects. Um, and part of it is because a lot, some of them were good transits. And, um, and I think we tend to focus on transits that cause us problems. You know, um, mm. you know, we'd sort of take the good stuff for granted. Um, for example, Pluto has been trying uh, my son and ascendant and things like that. And so I don't notice that. It's like just I take it for granted, right? Right. But one thing I have noticed, and I just noticed that sitting here, which is why I came up, is uh, Uranus is um, affecting my Venus right now. And uh, it's conjoining my Venus. And um, so I was kind of looking at relationships. I'm like, well, my marriage is stable. Nothing's really going on with that. However, <laughs> I noticed... Uh, a couple of months ago, I, I've always been a musician, and a couple of months ago, I just somehow read about synthesizers, and I decided I have to get a synthesizer. And I ended up buying two synthesizers, classic analog, old school synthesizers. And I've spent, over the last two or three months, I've spent like uh, tons of time researching, uh, reading books about synthesizers, researching the history of synthesizers. Uh, you know, playing around with synthesizers. And so just sitting here, I realized, yeah, well, okay, we have Venus and we have uh, Uranus and electronics. And right. uh, there you go. So, yeah, that's li and this is for like the first time ever. You've never done anything with synthesizers. No, I mean, before. I've always been a, a musician, but no, no, nothing with synthesizers. Yeah. And and it's like now I'm nuts over synthesizers. That, so. That's hilariously literal because <laughs> Uranus is the planet of like technology and yeah. electronics and things like yeah. that. And Uranus is hitting the ruler of your ascendant Venus, which is usually, especially as a Taurus rising, is more of a creative placement or an artistic placement. And for you as, as a musician, um, but then Uranus comes in and all of a sudden there's a, a difference. You're doing something that's different and a little bit like that you might have considered earlier in your life when you're just using classical instruments to be a bit weird to do like electronic music rather than something more more standard or classical. Um, that's, that's really funny. That's very literal. Yeah. yeah. It's very little. So I just thought I'd share that. So. I like that. I like that. And also your 10th house Saturn transit. And you were talking about those themes because it, it was similar themes that we were talking about the first house transits of like age and, and, and maturity, but also themes of authority, like becoming more of an authority in your community, community and looked up to as respected sort of like el elder member of your community, I think is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. that is cool as that Saturn 10th house transit in addition to Neptune or sorry, Jupiter in Pisces going through your 11th house of community and sort of just like growth and expansion there as well. Yeah. 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 And, and the things that I value, the quiet, quiet wisdom is what I've pursued all my life. And that's, what's actually coming to prominence and being recognized. So mm. yeah. Okay. Thanks. That makes sense. Thank you. All right. Um, does anybody, we still have some more time for another, maybe couple examples. Yeah. Hi. Hey, what's your name? Chelsea. Chelsea. Um, what's this is my your... daughter, Quinn. We're going to tie charts in together. Okay. Um, let's do yours. Did I spell your name right? Yes. Okay. What's your date of birth? December 15th, 1979. What 11, time? 1130 AM. And what city? Denver, Colorado. Okay. All right. And what's the other chart? Quinn. Uh, how do you spell it? Q-U-I-N-N. N-N, -N. N -N, okay. What date? May 18th, 2009. May 18th, 2009? 
and what time? Yes, 3.54 p.m. And what city? Denver, Colorado. No, Littleton. Littleton, Littleton Colorado. Littleton, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, and is your ascendant at eight Libra? Quinzes. Quinzes, okay. We're gonna, can we start with mine, then it'll yeah. tie in. Is your ascendant at seven Pisces? Uh-huh. Okay. Okay, so in March of 2020, Saturn went into my 12th. Um, and I'm a hairstylist, so we were shut down. Like Just like everybody completely. else, But like instant, like there was musings. We're like, no, not no. Right. Kind of denial. Um, but nevertheless, that obviously happened. Um, and eclipses were also going on in, a, was that before the Sagittarius eclipses started? I think it was, like, af I think, I think it right we were in the, the like Capricorn cancer eclipses, I want to say by then. I could be wrong. When Saturn went in to, um, sorry, here, let this me. going to tie into this. I think that's when the Sagittarius eclipses started. Okay. Around, you mean March of 2020? Mm-hmm. Okay. It's like really close. Oh, Maybe. the ones right after. Okay, yeah, you're right. In like June. Um, so. Yes. Sorry, I thought you were talking about the ones before. Yeah, this might have been the first one because it was like a partial mm -hmm. eclipse around June 5th of 2020. Yeah. So that was in Sagittarius, which was your 10th house. And yeah. it was actually very close to the degree mm -hmm. of your midheaven. Uh, yes. So I was, we had to go home. <laughs> uh, we were on lockdown, everybody, obviously. Um, I also got sick, all her and I. and um, Around this time in June? Mm -hmm. okay. uh, no, sorry. At the end of, when we were kind of like end of, March, beginning of April. Okay. But it all kind of starts to tie together. So 12th house, um, where you're secluded, isolation. Right. Eclipses in my 10th and 4th. Um, I actually started, I, through the process of COVID, uh, found it difficult to work in a salon just with all of the regulations that we had um, with Dora and everything else. And there's only a certain a number of people that can work in the salon at the same time. Obviously masks, all of that. Um, testing, just craziness. Mm. Um, that it actually, I started working from home. So oh, wow. 10th to 4th. Right. That's perfect. So the first right. eclipse on June 5th was in your 10th house of career. And then the mm -hmm. next one, two weeks later, was in your 4th house of home and living situation. And your career actually moved to your home. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I, I had a town home at that time. And my neighbors, because I, I owned a boutique-y kind of salon. So I had to move all of my salon equipment to my house temporarily to store it. Mm. And my neighbors thought I was doing hair from my house. So they reported me to Dora. Oh my gosh. And for the first time in 25 years that I've done hair, I had to defend my license and prove through all the photos that I took as I was closing my salon to safely close out my lease with my landlord. I had to submit all of that to Dora too. Okay. So then I realized that I didn't really care for my current situation and it wasn't conducive to working from home. So I needed to find someplace bigger mm -hmm. <laughs> and the different neighborhood, of course. Um, with different neighbors. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's a little bit of a 12th house transit too. Very, but... very Saturn in the 12th yeah. and a lot of chatty Cathy's and when I mentioned, times. cause so, the traditional, like the ancient authors, if you read right. like a first century or 10th century text, they always talk about enemies yeah. with the 12th house, but which seems abstract and kind of archaic but like in our actual daily lives when you think of it just as people that you don't get along with or people that work at cross purposes to you sometimes the meaning of that becomes much more tangible well the, the literal part is that they were all like looking from their windows so hidden enemies 12th house okay right? <laughs> nice. literally from their windows suspecting but having no idea what was really going on yeah so a little vindication as i was leaving i attended an hoa meeting and actually told them what happened and they we were like, 
Okay. Yeah, too late. Um, anyway, so in addition, this is where her part comes in. Um, she um, was no longer allowed to be physically at school. Mm-hmm. And so I also became a teacher at home okay. <laughs> for House Gemini. Right. Um, and uh, Saturn was going into her fifth house as a Libra rising. And so no longer being able to be in groups in her 11th and just being with her sister and me kind of fifth house kind of transit there, just work, you know, basically stifling her ability to, to kind of have fun. Yeah. Fifth the, house. The fifth house is usually the place of, of fun. Yeah. Um, so was it, was it fun? Not fun? No. Did you like me teaching you? Um, it was kind of nice to get one-on-one help, but <laughs> I do prefer being in a classroom sure. with yeah. my friends and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and that's interesting. So in your chart, you have Lib- Libra rising. So those same eclipses were falling in the third house, ninth house mm-hmm. axi- axis, which is the two houses of education and learning. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and so uh, as I was selling my town home, this was back in 2020 again, sorry, uh, was um, July of 2020. I sold it totally thinking I could find something else. And I couldn't, I did really well on the sale, but I had to live at my mom's house Mm. for four months until I, I was on a holdout for a certain neighborhood. Um, and so then starting in July of 2020, that was towards the end of that. I remember Mm -hmm. that, um, Venus retrograde. Yes. Um, which would have been in your fourth house. How, when was the last time you had lived with your mom prior to that? Um, when I was in college, so like, like just years ago. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's a great so, Venus retrograde right. example is sometimes when Venus goes retrograde mm-hmm. in a house, it can bring back a relationship or some sort of prior interaction mm-hmm. from years ago in the past and whatever that house is. And it just happened to be in your fourth house of parents. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and my mom's a Gemini. So, okay. That's great. Awesome. Which is Gemini is your fourth house. Uh-huh. Great. Um, and then December, 2020 found was able to finally move uh, in the neighborhood I wanted. Um, And then uh, February was able to begin work 2021 from home once the salon was kind of ready to go and all of that. You were finally able to move in December of 2020? Mm Mm-hmm. So that was around the next set of eclipses, basically Mm -hmm. then six months later in your 10th and your fourth houses. Mm -hmm. So December 14th was the Sagittarius eclipse yeah and i think we closed on the fourth of december okay uh-huh. so and that allowed you to both move and set up a new business yeah okay. so yeah and then going forward um in august of 21 hold on before we move on to the next one could you just yeah. explain a little bit more about that significance and the completion that happened in November and December, like what happened? You relocated your actual living situation and moved out from your mom's place? Yeah. So then that completed that like eclipse cycle of going from the public where I'd been for a number of years mm-hmm. to then working from home, like doing everything like North Node Gemini kind of eclipse series through that whole thing. And then what, like, what, what's the new working situation as of this point? So what? working from my house. Okay. But the positives is... Um, this was going to tie into the positive part of it, I guess. Um, obviously being more available to help, you know, with all the law, you know, they were, they were hybrid half the time. So it just made it really, it would be very hard to be, I don't see how parents do it where they can actually have to go to work, but then their kids are still home homeschooling and trying to oversee all that. So I was able to actually be there through it with them. Okay. To help them with that. So that was good. So this was also then the next phase of partially mm-hmm. learning from home for Quinn. Yeah. So <clears throat> then, um, well, my partner and I moved in together at that time, he has four kids <clears throat> and I have another daughter and, um, we found out August 13th. So yeah, August 13th last year of 2021. Uh huh. Okay. Um, the mother of his four kids, we found out, um, had alcoholism and she died. Wow. Um, 
And that was incredibly shocking. <laughs> and um, my ex-husband, who is now remarried, had a son within like nine days. Of that same event? Yep. Wow. Um, so, so that was August 13th. August 13th is when she passed away. Yeah, I'm looking at that Mars transit. So you mm-hmm. had an exact Mars return of transiting Mars conjoining mm-hmm. your natal Mars in the seventh house of relationships. And Saturn is squaring my moon. Oh, wow. Okay. Which so is the ruler of my fifth house. Transiting Saturn. It was at nine degrees mm-hmm. of Aquarius at that time, and it was squaring your moon at nine degrees of Scorpio. Uh-huh. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah. So we, I am now an unofficial mom of six <laughs> in wow. a very short period of time. Right. So, yeah, it's been a it's been a busy time. So I hear everybody with like the just kind of letting it go and letting it flow and <laughs> you got to just go with it. So, right. but uh, through the Saturn cycle so far has just been, you know, the 12th house also just, you know, either suffering yourself or helping other people that are suffering. Mm-hmm. That has been like a huge Saturn transit for me. Yeah, so Both people house. needing to like lean on you in order to get that help and you acting in that way to, yep. to help out other people. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it can I it can just keep on going, although I'm a little worried <laughs> going into my first house. But the really cool thing, and I this is I think yes, yet to manifest, is the latest uh Jupiter Neptune conjunction that just happened um in Pisces. Mm-hmm squared my son and Neptune and then sextiled my Venus, trined my Uranus and was op- is opposite my Saturn in the seventh. So I'm, I don't see any of that really being negative just because Jupiter is kind of at the helm of the whole thing. Right. Um, and just being Sagittarius, that's super helpful to me. So I'm really hoping that it's just a, you know, with everything that's kind of had to to transition and to be kind of let go, mm-hmm. that this is going to be something really big and new. Yeah. Just I'm... too many positive uh, indications, in my opinion. Um, and then Venus was exactly on my midheaven, or I'm sorry, my ascendant when that happened as well. So um, an exalted Venus, too. Yeah. So I'm really excited about that. Just Jupiter transiting through your first house, that can be a really positive period for for growth and and aspecting those other planets. And again, that's probably just reinforcing some of those themes of you playing that positive role in the lives of other people around you. Mm -hmm. And then um, her moon is actually in Pisces in the sixth. And so that's um, it's been a good I think she's going to have some some good stuff, but she also is going to have an exact. the eclipse coming up is going to be opposite her sun. Mm, okay. Eight, so. so the Taurus Scorpio yep. stuff, that's like a, usually when eclipses move into that can activate the financial axis. So mm-hmm. it could be like getting like a little job or starting to make money or something like that. Yeah. I was hoping she could get a summer job. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I didn't mean to <laughs> like put start. thoughts in the, but. Well, with another really cool thing about like kind of being a home, unofficial homeschooling parent mm. is, that the kids um, are really interested in astrology. And so that's why she's here today and just really kind of hoping that we can further the next 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 generation of, of young people to being exposed to astrology to help them, you know, maybe figure out in advance of leaving high school, like where, what, what they want to be doing, what they should be doing, kind of mm-hmm. gifts to them. So... Um, I think that's what's really been cool about, you know, having a little bit of control over the curriculum is mm. to kind of squeeze a lot of this stuff in and there's a huge interest in it. So um, that's been that's been another positive new beginning, I think, for the, the young kids. So, yeah, that makes a lot of sense yeah. and even more sense of those eclipses between the third house and the ninth house axis, because the third mm-hmm. house is like is typically education and like K through 12 through high school. But the ninth house typically is college, but the ninth house is also the house associated with astrology and things like that. So that makes sense of why both houses were activated with that eclipse series when you started doing homeschooling and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And then I'm doing, I'm going into a major ZR, lot of spirit beginning May, 
third or sixth, I can't remember, of this year in cancer, my fifth house ruler. So, okay. A lot of change coming, I think, but I think it's going to be good. Yeah. yeah. Well, and those eclipses are going to bounce back and forth between your third and ninth mm-hmm. from this point forward. Yeah. So, it makes me think of the previous person that was thinking about like writing a book with their third house transits, yeah. but maybe just something about communication and education or yeah. communication and teaching and maybe some of the things that you've gained over the past few years from having to do that um, could come into play in the future in terms of uh, teaching in some way. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. That was awesome. All right. Um, I think we have time for at least one more example, if anybody has one. Yeah, in the back of the room. Hello, everybody. I've been sitting over there, and when people are up here, I just kind of wishing they would look this way. So, hello, everybody. Right. <laughs> What's your name? Uh, my name is Lila. Okay. How do you spell it? Um, it's L I L A H. Okay. And what's your birth date? And so it's 2 11 1973. And what time? Um, 8 30. AM or PM? AM. AM. And what city? Um, Santa Fe, New Mexico. All right. Is your ascendant 27 Pisces? No, it's four degrees Aries. Wait, I hang on. Maybe I had the data wrong. You said February 11th, 1973 at 8.30 a.m. Okay, yeah, that might be the wrong time. Let's see here. Um, 8.50, a.m., okay. There it is. Four Aries rising. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, so this is good. This is a rising we haven't done yet. Um, so what what uh, what's the trends that you wanted to share with us? Um. So um. Well, when COVID first started, mm-hmm. I was an elementary teacher and a Target checkout person at night, and so like I just remember everybody checking out and like getting all their groceries and we're out of NyQuil on the shelves when I walked through the break room. Um, so it was going through, um, yeah. So I was never like locked down. I had like a piece of paper I kept in my car cause I was like an essential worker mm-hmm. and I started teaching online to my little kids online. And, um, so yeah, that was crazy. So there's major like job change with both of your jobs because yeah. the, the teaching thing suddenly initially shuts down or there's a little break or you have to switch to online basically at that point. Yeah, it, we switched to online. Okay. Yeah. So um, so my teaching, it went like um, started off online the following fall and then it went um, to in person. But when there was a few class classroom quarantines. But anyway, so. so that was part of the like 10th house stuff initially, at least like the lockdowns in March of 2015 was all in your all the transits in Capricorn were in your 10th house of career. Mm-hmm. And so it was both the teaching job, but then also suddenly the um, stakes being raised on your other job, which is otherwise like like a day to day job. But then all of a sudden, like you're like a frontline worker um, mm-hmm. in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. So um Exactly. Just nailed it right on the head there. And um, it was just interesting because I um, I was going through all these crazy changes. Like my hair was black, then it was blonde. Now, obviously, it's gray. And then um, and also I just I had like these different identities. I was like this checkout person and a teacher. And then I was online. And then, OK, so then when things started moving into my 11th house. Uh, my son's at 22 Aquarius. So it just went over, everything just went over that. But okay, so I gave up my teaching job to go into tr- early childhood education. Mm. And I 
did that for like six months. Then I did another job for like three weeks and I started substitute teaching. And so I got back into my school district just recently. And now I'm like trying just to get everything back. And I like I have a job interview on Monday and I just, I hate job interviewing. Like last time when I got my teaching license and started interviewing, it took me like three years of interviewing because just as an Aquarius sun with my Uranus and Libra training my sun so closely, I just always go back and forth between like being like an outcast. And I just feel like, you know, when I go to these interviews, I just don't, I can never get the job. And so here I am. Like, I know that I can keep substitute teaching and stuff. And um, it's fine. I keep the substitutes make a lot of money now because there's such a shortage, but I don't have health insurance with it. But, you know, no complaints. People are off, a lot off worse, worse off a lot more than that anyway. But um, yeah, it's just been so weird. Uh, Jupiter, I blame <clears throat> like all my <clears throat> losing like my job, just everything. I was like high on this Jupiter, like nothing can stop me because it like went over my natal Venus and my sun. And then, um, then also though, my <sighs> Saturn went over, Saturn's been back and forth and so I let go of this like 13 year relationship, mm. which, and I have Pluto in the seventh house and Uranus and this relationship was so much drama. I can't even tell you. <laughs> it was just drama. And so, um, I, that ended and now that person is now just my friend. He has a girlfriend now and like I talked to my therapist about it and she's like, yeah, you know, people, you seem happy single, you know, and I totally am mm -hmm. so happy. And like, she's like, if you want to hang out with him, when you want to hang out with him, great. And I was like, yeah, I mean, people do all sorts of things. I'm not saying I want to, but there's polyamorous people. There's people on the spectrum. There's whatever. It's just all good. And I'm just, I'm just really good single now, but. I'm yeah. just, you know, listening to everybody who came up here. I'm just like, we've just been through all of us so much. And like nothing in my life is the same. Nothing. Right. And um, that's an interesting manifestation of that Saturn transit over your Venus in the 11th house of friends. But just having a relationship come to an end, but then having it turn into more of a friendship. Totally. And yeah, it's just we're just friends now. And um also, it was interesting because I was looking for jobs in my old school district, but I got rid of my car because I never believed in having car payments, right? So, mm. like, I was taking the bus all around Boulder to get to my jobs and stuff, and then I wanted to apply to school jobs, teaching jobs, like in Broomfield and Longmont and everywhere, but I didn't have a way to get there on the bus. So then my ex call him um he's kind of a bad boy again not pluto <laughs> um but he's so sweet like he's got a uh, uh moon and leo he's just so giving and generous but also like <sighs> crazy relationship so anyway he gave me his like old beat up rusty old truck to but it works and so i've been driving that and Anyway, it's just like, I just feel like that Venus in Aquarius is just getting these weird elect eclectic, like helping things to me. Anyway, I'm rambling. Yeah. That's just what I do in the job interviews too. And then so they look at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> were some of the transportation issues that was from like 2020 and 2021 onward? Yeah, yeah. Um 2021 I just had the cutest car which had been stolen a couple times the name was Speedy this was my car it had a sunroof a manual like totally old but it died so I didn't want to spend money and I was like yeah carefree no car no car insurance to pay for it taking the bus Woo! And I was like right. wait a minute <laughs> 
So it was funny. Yeah, that makes sense. And those eclipses were just between your your ninth house and your third house. And again, just one of the literal meanings of third house transits is just short distance travel and like how you get around town. And and that can mean things like that, new new ways of traveling. Um, I love that you have the ruler of the 10th house of career is Saturn and it's located in the third house, which is associated with, as we talked about before, like um, K through 12, like education, basically. Um, and that's really one of your, it seems like your primary focus is and in, in interest is teaching mm-hmm. kids. Yeah, yeah, it's totally. I just love working with kids and I stopped teaching because there was just so many hoops to jump through. and like. Um, also, like in my school building, all the teachers just wouldn't even talk to me. And I just felt like such an outcast. So when I went to um, the preschool, I was like, let me just enjoy these sweet babies, these sweet children. And um, it was so fun. But then like that, there, there were problems with that because like my back started to hurt from picking them up. And then some of the teachers were like, when they cry, you can't pick them up. And so then I was like, ah, I'm not supposed to pick them up. What am I supposed to do? And like all the teachers were like, was just like a fishbowl, you know, like I couldn't get along with anybody. And yeah. And some of the, you had to switch to online teaching during 2020, which would have Mm -hmm. been tough as well as those eclipses are going back and forth between your third and your ninth. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So, um, but interestingly, I got this long-term substitute job teaching online mm-hmm. for first grade. For It's just a total online school. So every day I just go in and I do a Zoom meeting with these first graders all day. <laughs> and it's really fun. But I just, and I, I think that um, it's got to be that Venus in Aquarius that's getting me all these eclectic, weird technology job things. I don't know. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, I love that you have, you have the, the Aquarius sun in Venus, but your, your Mercury's over in Pisces and you have like a very sort of like soft way of speaking. I think it would be really amazing, like with children, I'm sure, but it's a great like Mercury and Pisces example. Oh, thank you. That's, that's really kind. Um, yeah. But then I just feel like I feel like such a split personality because I have this Aries rising and um, like I have that Mars Pluto kind of close square. So like I have this total anger issue and but I keep it totally under wraps. So and also like when people see me, they just they hear my voice, but I don't think they see the Aries Aries rising or, you know, I don't know. I'm just such a weird enigma. I don't mean to focus so much on myself, but (laughs) sorry, guys. Yeah, and I like that. It's a good example of how people, different people have different distributions of planets and different elements and different signs. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people see or connect with like one part of a person's chart, but we don't always see like the full spectrum until you've really gotten to know a person or Mm -hmm. sometimes it's only the person themselves that understands all the different parts of their chart and that's why it's so important for us you know our our own birth chart is always going to be our best example uh, for our entire lives because we're never going to know anyone better than we know ourselves Um, yeah so I really I like that Um, yeah that makes a lot of sense well I'm I'm interested to see how things go Um, you've got those eclipses now I guess it's going to shift from your Uh, third and ninth house axis and that like teaching and communication and travel axis over to your second house and your eighth house so more of the financial axis Mm -hmm. do you have any the first eclipse already started there in Taurus in November do you have any inkling of where that's going I guess you're you're interviewing for different jobs now Mm -hmm. okay yeah um well once I so yeah so I just realized oh my gosh I you know eventually gonna need to retire and all this so I feel like the second eighth house axis is just sort of me coming to face that um a little bit like Mm -hmm. um I don't know it just feels like very unstable just I I have a summer school job but then July I don't know and I have to go to all these interviews but I can always substitute teach it's just or find something else um so I yeah I don't know I'm thinking the second eighth house um financial stability yeah I think some of that will start to become more clear um, over the course of the next month as this first eclipse series fully comes into play and just making 
uh, more long-term financial plans, I think will become a lot more clear over the course of the next month with those eclipses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that was a really good, that was a good example. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to say I've been listening to your podcast, then your YouTube, and I just adore your YouTube. And I'm so glad you're doing this in person. I'm just so excited. Thanks. Yeah, I'm excited to be mm -hmm. here doing it and be able to record this and then be able to share this with the community outside of here who can't attend. But, you know, it's like a special privilege always to be able to meet other astrologers in person and like do this face to face. There's an element that's really hard to replicate on Zoom or something like that. So I'm glad we can we can do this again. Yeah, thanks so much. It's yeah, you know, you're just like online and you there's these friends you have online, yet you've never met them, but you love them so much. And right. well, it was a very big treat. <laughs> yeah. Well, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. All right. Um, I think so. It's 3.53 and we're supposed to wrap up at 4. So I think that might be it for our, our workshop today, talking about transits for the last two years. Um, so we didn't get through quite as many examples as I thought we might, but I think we still were able to cover like quite a bit and we got some good stories and we got a good idea about how some of these long-term outer planet transits with slow moving planets and also eclipses and different things like that can sometimes manifest in very literal ways in a person's life. So I hope that's given everybody something to think about and something to pay attention to as you're looking at your own transits in the future. And especially as you start thinking about some of the transits that are coming up, like the eclipse series that's going to begin later this month in Taurus and Scorpio, and just thinking about what houses those are falling in in your chart. So obviously there's more, um, there's additional techniques that we could have looked at, like secondary progressions or different Time Lord techniques, and there's different ways that those can add additional layers of subtlety and nuance and other information uh, that we didn't even get to here. But I hope that in looking at this, you can see how sometimes even the most simple techniques of looking at slow moving outer planet transits through the houses can really tell you a lot about what's going on in a person's life during different stages. So, um, yeah, so I think that's going to be it for this meeting. So, um, this went pretty well, so I think we're going to try to resume doing these meetings, and we're going to shoot for the second Saturday of the month, uh, usually from 2 to 4 p.m. here at the Mercury Cafe um, every month from this point forwards. And with any luck, hopefully everything with like COVID will, will be okay and we'll agree with that and we'll just like get the group going again and build up some momentum and keep meeting up here and doing things like this every month here at the Mercury Cafe. Um, so, uh, I think we've still got the room for another hour if people want to hang out and talk and socialize before they start setting up for dinner at five. So feel free to, to talk and, and, you know, introduce yourselves to each other and just start rebuilding the community that we sort of put on hold or had to put a pause on here two years ago. Um, so thanks everyone for coming to this meeting and I look forward to seeing you next month again. Special thanks to all the patrons that supported the production of this episode of the podcast through our page on patreon.com. In particular, thanks to the patrons on our producers tier, including Thomas Miller, Catherine Conroy, Christy Moe, Ariana Amour, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Sumo Kopic, Issa Sabah, Jake Otero, Morgan McKinsey, and Kristen Otero. If you like the work that I'm doing here on the podcast and you would like to find a way to support it, then please consider becoming a patron through my page on patreon.com. And in exchange, you'll get access to bonus content, such as early access to new episodes, the ability to attend the live recording of the month ahead forecast each month, access to a private monthly auspicious elections report that we put out each month, access to exclusive episodes that are only available for patrons, or you can also get your name listed in the credits at the end of each episode. For more information, go to patreon.com slash astrology podcast. The main software we use here on the podcast to look at astrological charts is called Solar Fire for Windows, which is available at alabe.com, and you can use the promo code AP15 to get a 15% discount. 
For Mac users, we use a similar set of software by the same programming team called AstroGold for Mac OS, which is available from astrogold.io, and you can use the promo code ASTROPODCAST15 to get a 15% discount on that as well. If you would like to learn more about the approach to astrology that I outline on the podcast, then you should check out my book titled Hellenistic Astrology, The Study of Fate and Fortune, where I traced the origins of Western astrology and reconstructed the original system that was developed about 2,000 years ago. And in this book, I outline uh, basic concepts, but also take you into intermediate and advanced techniques for reading a birth chart, including some timing techniques. So you can find out more about the book at hellenisticastrology.com slash book. The book pairs very well with my online course on ancient astrology called the Hellenistic Astrology Course, which has over 100 hours of video lectures where I go into detail about teaching you how to read a birth chart and showing hundreds of example charts in order to really demonstrate how the techniques work in practice. So find out more information about that at theastrologyschool.com. Also, special thanks to our sponsors, including the Mountain Astrologer magazine, which is available at mountainastrologer.com, the Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs, available at honeycomb.co, and the Astrogold Astrology app, which is available for both iPhone and Android at astrogold.io. There are also two major astrology conferences happening this year. The first is the Northwest Astrological Conference, happening May 26th through the 30th, 2022, near Seattle, Washington. Find out more information at norwac.net. And the second is the International Society for Astrological Research Conference, which is taking place August 25th through the 29th, 2022, in Westminster, Colorado. And you can find out more information about that at isar2022.org.